Greetings, chess players. My name is Chris Torres. This is Daily Chess Musings, the free online summer chess camp. And uh, joining me right now, we have Grandmaster Vinay Bot. Um, and uh, Vinay um, was a household name around uh, uh, Northern California for uh, for many years, and then uh, he went to college and. Uh, um, Worked on his, uh, you know, other passions, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the interview. Um, but uh, uh, Vinay, um, he became the youngest chess master in the history of the United States Chess Federation. And um, he, um, and, and by doing so, of course, uh, you know, famously Bobby Fischer had, uh, had done this. And, uh, you know, we're comparing different eras, so... You know things things are different, um, but uh, yeah, Vinay Vinay became a uh, a chess master at a much younger age than uh, Hi Leo than uh, um, than uh, Bobby Fischer did, and then uh, um, he also became um, the youngest I am um, in in our in our nation's history, and uh, so I want to uh, begin by. Uh, um, letting uh, v Vinay speak to you and then I'm going to ask him some questions about the book that you guys may end up um, that you guys may end up winning this week at chess camp good morning Vinay how are you doing morning uh, I'm doing well uh, um, thanks Chris for the uh, intro awesome. I'm excited to be here um, so you wrote a book is, is this your first uh, chess book <laughs> Uh, it's my first uh, chess book. It's my first book of any kind, really. Um, I have, I think I contributed a chapter to one book a long time ago. Um, it was called, uh, it was with Euler, I think. Um, ah, I have a copy of that. Chess. Uh, <laughs> On my shelf. I'm, oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think I, I, I wrote one chapter, like uh, added a few of my own games to one chapter. Um, but other than that, I've never written a chess book, so this was a Absolutely. pretty big so undertaking. Absolutely, so maybe your chess book, uh, second chess book, will be uh, how how I wrote a chess book. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I think this one took me a, a little over uh, from start to finish, probably about uh, wow. a little over two years. Wow. So, yeah. And you know, um, um, I have while. been thoroughly enjoying um, your your book. Um, taking my time going through rereading uh, certain things going through the uh, going through the the games with an actual chessboard and uh, a couple of things I find very interesting about your book um, and that is the uh, the format of it and and I love the format of it um, first of all and it's it's so it's so unique because um, if you're looking you know for an inspirational story about the uh, you know son of uh, first generation uh, immigrants to Silicon Valley and uh, um, you know all these things about your childhood and your your journey through chess it's in here and if you also are approaching this book looking for um, strategy and instruction chess instruction it's also in here um, it's and it's it's combined together very, very neatly. Um, I'm sure that must have taken a lot of effort on, on your part. Can you talk a little bit about the, the process of how you, how you talk about your life's journey, but also are, are putting in so much uh, instruction? Yeah, no, I think um, I, you, you summed up uh... You, you summed up sort of my goals with the book, actually, to a large degree. Um, so I, I'm glad that came across uh, when you read it, uh, because I, I was, you know, like I, I've seen a bunch of chess books. A lot of them are like best game collections where all you get are the moves and the analysis. You don't hear as much about the, the player's life itself, uh, them, like from their own words as well. And so like for me, that was something that I wanted to try and do I started writing not actually confident that this would end up being a book. Um, I, 
it was like a pleasant surprise when uh, the publisher Quality Chess said they were interested in it. Um, but uh, for me, I started writing, and I, I, I was sort of like telling stories are like writing stories about my chess life. I used to write a uh, chess blog and things like that. Um, and so that's where it all started. And then I was like, well, hey, look, like I do have some interesting stories to tell as a chess player. Um, let me share those. And so that, that's sort of yeah, how it all um, started. And, and you mentioned it took you uh, uh, two years when you, you know, decided to take some of these, you know, stories and games from your blog and and, and start um, putting in other stories. It took you about two years to, to produce what we're reading here. Yeah, uh, I started in January 2021, and then it came out now in, uh, yeah, like late April, May of uh, just this year. I, I did try to, um, my blog was really focused on just like a few years of my chess career. Um, and it was uh, really when I was, playing professionally uh, when I had become a grandmaster already, whereas this book focuses actually a lot more, uh, bulk of the book is stuff that like I never wrote about um, in the blog, and I, I tried to keep um, probably some of the stories separate, things like that, so, yep. Um, but yeah, I think there's stories of me as a kid, like playing in scholastic tournaments, uh, where, you know, um, some kids would get excited about, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like win a rook right here, and they would like get too excited. They'd like jump out of their seat and they would mm -hmm. forget to think for like one more move. Like, wait, why is yes. he giving me that rook right now? And uh, then like, I, I have a brother, um, he's five years older and uh, I tried to, I mean, he tried to get me on his high school chess team, for example. Um, and so I pretended to be taking a mm -hmm. high school math class when I was like, um, I was not that good at math, especially then. <laughs> and so uh, there, there are stories like that just throughout the book. That was, part of it was meant to be that, like, uh, I really do love chess. Um, I wanted to, like, make sure I communicated that, but also share, like, how my experiences shape, like, my choices as a chess player, um, how I was a chess player, things like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, so. it's, it's an awesome, awesome read. Um... I put it, you know, I put it with uh, my top five favorite chess books of all time. Um, uh -huh. and, oh, wow. And, okay, thank you. you know, certainly, you know, I'm a little biased because uh, I was, you know, involved in this, in this, you know, scholastic scene. Um, and uh, you were, you were the brightest star, the brightest star in, uh, in Northern California scholastic chess. Um, and... Uh, so you mentioned it, it took you two years, and you finished it um, in 2021, you said? I started in 2021, and then I uh, submitted my final draft in okay. December 2022, so, um, actually. Kind of going so, reverse yeah. from there, then. Um, I think the, the last games that I, I've seen you play in uh, you know, major chess tournaments may have been uh, 2014. So what what was happening with Vinay yeah, between two thousand four? I think a lot of people in in the Bay Area and California wonder what what happened with Vinay between two thousand fourteen and twenty twenty one. No, it's um, for a, from a chess perspective. Uh, basically, I disappeared. Um, I think I uh, I I'd started working. Um, I I work as a data scientist, basically. Um, here in the Bay Area, I live in Oakland now. So, um, and I, I like, I enjoyed a lot of the problems I was working on at work. I to to play chess at a high level, you do have to keep training and studying. And I wasn't, um, I wasn't interested really or willing to put in that time and energy. Every so often, I would play a blitz tournament. So I, I played a blitz tournament at the Berkeley Chess School actually earlier this year. Um, I played at the Mechanics Institute, a rapid tournament, a couple years ago. Um, I'll play one-off events like that. Um, I'm actually going to play a blitz tournament uh, later this year at the Mechanics as well, uh, next week. Um, and so I'll, I'll play like one of those one-day events. But um, otherwise, yeah, I would say uh, I follow a lot of chess still, even between 2014 and 2023, 2021. Uh, but I haven't played a slow game actually since, yeah, like you said, 2014. You know, it's, um... It's 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 interesting, and you know it it brings up a good point, 
that even if um, a tournament player um, isn't playing, you know, the the slow games, I mean, you you were, first of all, I mean, you this took a lot of hours to, to do, um, and there's no way, in, in my mind, you could have uh, done this and been playing chess professionally simultaneously, because it's, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, chess book um, that, that you know, must have taken so much of time and effort to uh, to put together. But uh, you you were involved in the in the chess community in other ways, and you were following chess. So you uh, uh, obviously you would have uh, um, played through um, and, and been following basically the entire uh, uh, Magnus Carlsen reign as world champion, just you know mm -hmm. from from the comfort of your own own home and uh, you you played Magnus right I seem to recall that uh, you you got to play uh, a blitz game with uh, Magnus yeah I, um, I actually played him soon after he became world champion uh, in early 2014 so um, I used to take lessons mm -hmm. at the Fremont Public Library um, f for those of you watching who know where uh, the Fremont main mm -hmm. library is on Stevenson Boulevard in Fremont um, I used to take the uh, yeah. Friday afternoon classes there. And um, through that, I met some people who later uh, turned out to be very successful business people in the Bay Area. And um, when Magnus was visiting after winning the world championship, uh, one of them invited me over uh, while also inviting Magnus. And so um, we played Bug House against each other. Uh, Joe Lonson and I did win that game mm -hmm. against uh, that Bug House game. Um, Magnus was kind of annoyed about that. He's a pretty competitive person. Um, and we played a, a Blitz game uh, afterwards. And uh, I include mm -hmm. the Blitz game in the book. It's like the second game. Um, it's probably actually one of the better games I've ever mm -hmm. because I should have won. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I ended up uh, blunder both of us were down to probably about like 25 seconds or so at the end of the blitz game uh, I had a winning end game, but um, managed to blunder it away. So my one beating Magnus I um, it's, it's, I did it's, blow it unfortunately. You know one thing to to you know think about playing Magnus But when you're and I've also uh, lost to Magnus Carlson and so has everybody else that I uh, that I know um, It's it's another <laughs> thing to yeah. you know like sit across from him and uh, just, you know, especially uh, during that era when he became, you know, world champion um, right after. Um, that, I mean, he, he was a, uh, he, he brought like an energy with him and uh, uh, nerves and, 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 and lack of focus, you know, uh, occurs in his opponents. Um, yeah, he... No, for sure. Yeah, I think actually it's something that every, uh, like whatever sport you're playing, um, I feel like the top, the very top people have that effect on their opponents of, you know, they, they seem to play mm -hmm. worse when they're playing the number one person than playing number um, two And or then uh, I so. also, you know, um, you included also a game um, with David Bronstein. And... Yeah, an an another Blitz game. Um, for those of you watching who don't know... Uh, David Bronstein was um, one of the top players in the world in the 1950s, especially. Uh, he played through the 1960s. He was top and like one of the strongest players in the 1940s too. Uh, but he tied a match for the world championship with Mikhail uh, Botvinnik. Um, at the time, there was no tie breaks or anything like that, so Botvinnik retained the title. Uh, but yeah, Bronstein was one of the best players in the world, and I, I was an eight-year-old kid. Um, but I got a chance to play a blitz game against him. Um, and he, he, I think he purposely gave me a shot in the opening, uh, but I didn't actually take advantage of it. And then he, he absolutely mm -hmm. destroyed me afterwards. So, um, different, different class of player really to be that strong. Um, he, he wrote one of the most famous chess books probably ever on, uh, mm -hmm. the 1953 Zurich, uh, tournament, which, um, for anybody who's like interested in studying like a really good game collection and just uh, learning a lot specifically about like strategic play, Bronstein's book I think is um, really one of the best that like. It, it is a, it is an excellent book. It's not terribly exciting, 
Um, yeah. It's not That's like your book. Yeah, your book is a, is a much yeah, um, better read and uh, just, you know, much, much more enjoyable. Um, you know, playing through the, uh, the 53 Zurich book feels like work. Yeah. It, and reading uh, your true. book that's true. and, and yeah. playing through the games, it, it didn't feel that way. It, 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 it was fun. And uh, um, seeing the, the old photos and the, the pictures of, from your notebook and uh, other, other tidbits that you included in there, the, the fun anecdotes, it, it, was, it was absolutely fun. Um, and, uh, Bra of course, Bronstein was not only a super strong, you know, li like you said, he, he tied Botvinnik. Um, but he, uh, he was very creative. He was a, a, a very creative, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I recommend, uh, everybody to, uh, check out a few of his games and you'll find, um, some, some really interesting chess from David Bronstein. He, he was not a, uh, a boring chess player. Um, and, and you got to play him when you were 14, you said, right? Oh, eight, eight. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. even younger. Um, yeah, I, so I you was played only him when you were when eight. Boston. Yeah. And uh, what what sort of? Because mm -hmm. um, uh, I I try and create these opportunities for a bunch of my students. Um, you know, recently a bunch of top mm -hmm. players came to uh, San Francisco, and so some of my students, you know, played with Magnus and played with Prague and and so on and so forth. And they, you know, they're about okay, that age awesome. too. Yeah. But I, I want to hear it. Um, I want to hear from you, um, playing, playing a, uh, a player, a famous, famous, um, brilliant, you know, professional grandmaster chess player at age eight. What did that do for you? I think for me, um, it was, in the moment, it was actually, I didn't understand just how good, like, a grandmaster could be. <clears throat> um, I'd heard the title, uh, but, um, and I think similar to how some of, like you brought some of your students to, to meet Magnus, um, I, I played David Bronstein at, I think it was the Palo Alto Chess Club, uh, or like it was a chess club in Palo Alto, it was at the Kappa Chess Academy mm -hmm. run by Joseph Soroker. And um, similar to Magnus being here for a tournament, Bronstein was here because um, he was playing a match against at the time, like one of the better computer programs uh, made by IBM. This is before Deep Blue. And um, so I, I think somebody told me about that. I managed, to, uh, I managed to get in similar to how I think you got some of your kids in. And uh, like playing Bronstein in the moment, I think people told me this guy is a legend. Um, and I had the sense afterwards to actually write the game down because um, it's a blitz game, right? So you're not writing those games down normally. But uh, luckily, I think I, I I learned over time that, oh, wait, like, this guy, not like, this is what a grandmaster really, like, their level really is. He played for a world championship. He was, like, call it top two or three in the world. Um, for me, it was, I think, really cool just to get a chance to play somebody at that level. Um, and I think... As I got a little bit older, when I was eight, I didn't understand the historical nature of the game. But as I got to be like, say, a teenager and so on, I, I started to understand a little bit more about the history. And that then it made a lot more sense of like, oh, man, like I got a chance to play this guy. Um, so it, it was pretty awesome. I think uh, I'm lucky that I, I got a chance to play him. I, I've, luck I've met all the world champions since Spassky, except for Bobby Fischer, I've met all the world wow. champions starting with Spassky. So Spassky, Karpov, Kasparov, Anand, um, Magnus, yeah. Although I haven't met, I haven't met Dingler um, right now, so. So uh, you, you, you played him a blitz game, and then afterwards you just, uh, you just calmly uh, stepped aside and wrote down all the moves from memory at age eight. I, I um, well, it was a short game. I, um, it was a very short game, so. Uh, he 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 gave me one shot in the opening. Mm -hmm. I used to play a lot of gambits as a kid. Um, I used to like tactics and things like that. Um, and I like, still love tactics, but it was like, I used to always want to sacrifice a pawn sure. to get ahead in development. And um, 
I think Bronstein gave me one shot right there where, like, objectively, like, I should have had a good position. But um, once I missed that one shot, he was unforgiving. And he just, he, he showed me, like, okay, this is, this is, like, sort of the, the highest level of play. It's, I, I would imagine it's, like, if I went on a basketball court with Steph Curry, he might give me one yeah. shot in, like, a game of horse where he's just fooling around. But if he really wants yeah. to play, it's over. Yeah, so. uh, I, I, you know, that that's a, a really good um, comparison right there. You know, Steph Curry to David Bronstein. I mean, this is the the level of player we're we're, we're discussing. Um, well, I uh, um, am really happy to to have you here, and I thought it would be cool to uh, have you explain a game or two to us so let me make sure i find my chess.com window because i have all these windows we had a little bit of, i started late with a little bit of uh, technical um issues with my uh, computer people in the morning meetings found me spill coffee on my stuff um so that, you know don't you know <laughs> don't spill coffee on your stuff right this is a this is an important important uh, educational moment um but let's uh <clears throat> um, which, uh, which, uh, you, you sent me two games in email and I've, uh, preloaded them in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, analysis board. Uh, wh which one would you like to start with? Uh, let's start with the game against okay. Ronda. The Got first it one, up. Actually. All right. So first of all, uh, um, how old are you when, when this game was uh, being played? This was 2006. Uh, so I was mm -hmm. 22 at the time, um, and I was uh, international master. Um, I was rated, as you can see here, uh, 2409, and I was playing a strong Peruvian grandmaster, Julio Granda Zuniga. Um, so he's rated 2634 here. I think he's been almost. He's never made it to 2700, but um, I think he got probably to wow. 2680, 2690, and uh, he's self-taught sort of player um and it, yeah I, I i would say he's a pretty mm -hmm. amazing player and what he's achieved um for me though yeah I'm, I'm playing up about 200 rating points here um and at the time uh you know I, I was getting back into chess after college actually so um this was a big game for me and it's part of the reason awesome. I wanted to, let's to, take a look to go over it today so um you, you start with uh, d4 and uh, yep. Julio plays knight f6. And then uh, you play uh, c4. And um, let me make sure I have e6. Yes. Uh, he plays e6, and, I think. Uh, go, go ahead and stop me, you know, at, at any point to, uh, you know, give us some of your uh, analysis and, and insight into, into what's happening. But... Uh, yeah, For sure. White's uh, White's got you know, play, playing classically has has a space advantage, and uh, Black's using more of a, a hyper modern approach. Yeah. Uh, and um, so Black's kind of planning what is often called the Nimzo Indian or Queens Ooh. Indian, Bogo mm -hmm. Indian. There's a few different uh, options right there. Um, I started playing one d four the Queens pawn openings um, actually. Uh, right around the time I was graduating from college, I um, I just wanted to do something different. I used to play e4 uh, all the time as a mm -hmm. kid, um, and I uh, when I started playing d4, um, I actually was playing the Trumpowski at first. So that was uh, on move two, mm -hmm. bishop g5. So um, it's a fun opening, uh, but I had just lost a game in that. And so for this game, I decided, okay, I'll try something a little bit different. So we're, we're totally in, you know, classical mainline um, stuff. And then yep. you play knight f3, move that totally makes sense. And now uh, we're going to learn a little bit more of your uh, opponent's intentions here. Um, and he plays bishop b4, check. And mm -hmm. uh, you block with knight b to d2. Um, what about the other options there? Uh, every move here is actually uh -huh. pretty reasonable. Um, and it's a good question. Why not uh -huh. bishop d2? Why not knight c3? Um, so the move knight c3 transposes to another very common line in what's called the Nimzo uh -huh. Indian defense. Um, it's a totally fair move. 
Bishop d2 puts the question to Black's bishop right away of, hey, like, what are you going to do? Do you trade and uh, help White develop his other knight? Um, and for me, the reason I played knight bd2 is because uh, I tended to... Um, I tend to like playing with the knights just in general. Uh, there's something about, I don't know, maybe the way the knight moves or like the idea of a fork, things like that, that always kind of um, interested me as a kid. Uh, but also in this line with knight bd2, my hope was that I could get the two bishops later. So even though I like the knights, um, generally people consider two bishops to be a little bit stronger than a bishop and knight pair or two knights. And so my next idea here is really to kick the bishop away with a3 um, and then say, okay, like if you want to lose time with your bishop or you can give up your bishop for my knight on d2. Um, and my hope was that I would just get the bishop pair and I would say, okay, like I'm playing a strong player. Um, I, like I'm playing somewhat conservatively here. Knight bd2 is not the most aggressive move for sure. Um, actually in the game against... Uh, Magnus that I you know we were just talking about earlier um, if I played the move Bishop d2 there's a chance that we could transpose into that uh, Magnus game uh -huh. that 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 involved uh, me bringing the bishop out which is what I think more of the strong grandmasters play than the snipe move mm -hmm. but you, you know you bring up a point you haven't moved a bishop out and uh, um, it means that, you know they aren't going to get traded early and you're thinking about a uh, possible end game with the uh, bishop pair already and we're on uh, we're on night uh, we're on move four we're on move four yep and, and you're already kind of thinking what you might like in an end game and it's affecting your your choice chess chess is beautiful this way um, all phases of the game are, are connected let's see what uh, black does he castles mm-hmm and then you, you play a3, and you're giving your opponent that choice. Retreat the bishop, or trade it for the knight. And your opponent retreats to uh, e7. The, the funny thing when he retreated to e7 was that um, he picked up the bishop like he was going to move it forward. Um, and he I, I thought he was going to take my knight on d2. Then he puts the bishop back. He never let go uh -huh. of the piece. Um, he puts the bishop back on b4, and he thinks for like another 30 seconds or so, and he says, okay, I'm moving back. Um, so I was a little, it was my first time playing Julio, and I was a little bit confused of like, hey, this is move five of the mm -hmm. game. Um, this is something he's probably done before, played before. Uh, what's going on here? But he retreated, which I was happy to see because... Um, now I can take the full center by playing e4. And so I was pretty happy with myself at this point. And uh, Adit, you are absolutely correct. Um, I did get uh, an email about the uh, the fair play issue, and uh, I'm certainly looking into it. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, don't, uh, we don't throw around accusations in, in chat. So um, guys, uh, don't, don't uh, do that. All right, and uh, you play e4. So you've got uh, domination in, in the middle of the board. Um, and Black better do something about that soon. Let's see. D5 is what Black plays. And you have a lot of choices here. Yeah, um, there's a lot of uh, pawn captures that are available on D5 specifically. Uh, or White can also um, ignore, just guard the, guard the E4 pawn, ignore the immediate sort of trades, or you can push back, uh, push forward, sorry, with um, e4 to mm -hmm. e5. And I chose to play um, e5 here because I get a little bit more space. Um, there's usually, uh, right, like, in the book I explained that one of the ways I learned how to play was through this, uh, these 30 rules of chess by Ruben mm -hmm. Fine. They're really not rules like you move the pieces. They're more like principles that you're meant to follow. So it's things like open with the center pawn, develop knights before bishops. Uh, and the reason that he recommends, for example, knights before bishops is that knights tend to take longer for wherever they're going. Bishops move all in one go, right? And so there's this idea of like moving knights before bishops because you have time to commit uh, to your bishops later. Um, and here it's, uh, I just want to grab a little bit more space 
usually more space means a little bit of an advantage. And so I, when I see this opportunity to hit the knight on f6, yeah, I decided to kick it away. And here he, um, here he made, I think, probably his first real mistake. This is um, a position that uh, he had actually played before from the white side. Um, so in this game, Julio is playing black, but he had actually played this before from the white side. And, it, uh, and his opponent played the right move, knight fd7. But instead here, he plays knight e4. And this turns out to be a mistake because after I played bishop d3, um, we trade knights on mm -hmm. d2. And uh, what ends up happening is um, you, you can see the change in the position here. Knight takes d2, bishop takes d2. Basically, I've gotten both my bishops out now for yeah. free, right? He hasn't done anything. He's he's removed his one one of his developed pieces, the knight on f6 from the board, and I've got two more developed pieces in return. And so for me, this was like, hey, this is a good trade um, because he's basically he's helping me develop for for like nothing in return. So um, at this point, I've got a little bit more space in the center. I've got three pieces developed versus his one. Uh, so I was feeling I was feeling pretty good about myself, although the position's not winning or anything. Uh, but I was feeling good about myself. And he plays uh, DXC4. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to, you know, cost your bishop an extra move. And yep. bishop takes C4. And then uh, um, Julio plays B6. So um, tell me what you're what you're thinking right now. Uh, so at b6 was actually um, what I expected mm -hmm. him to play. Uh, it's what I what I would have played at first on my own from his side too. So like one of the ways that I would approach a lot of positions is um, okay, expect your opponent to play what you think is the best move. And in this case, for me, it's like, well, how is he going to develop that bishop on c8? So let's um, Let's Fianchetto the bishop. Let's play b6. Uh, as I started thinking, though, some more, I realized now he's got a little bit of a problem. He wants to typically play this move c5 mm -hmm. to uh, challenge white center. Uh, but he wants his knight to be able to help support that. And his, his development structure right now is going to be a little bit difficult for him to get all his pieces out quickly in the right, like, sort of right order. Um, and so it hit me afterwards that, yes, he wants to get his bishop to this diagonal, but what he could have done was play bishop d7 to c6. Um, he spends two moves to bring the bishop out, but he doesn't create any weaknesses on the queen side. Uh, he can bring the knight around later. That's um, really clever. I mean, he's, he's already down, um, you know, in, in development, but uh, the yep. bishop, you know, d7 to c6, that's really clever. I, I think the key bishop d7 to c6, and then, uh -huh. then he, he can bring his knight to d7, uh -huh. his knight to b6, and then knight to d5. Wow. And his position is rock solid. Wow, that, that's um, very uh, insightful. Um, I, and I, uh, like, like, I think what was surprising to me about this moment in the game was that I, um, I during the game, I thought he was playing the right uh -huh. moves. Uh, and then it only dawned on me as I thought further, I was like, wait, I can take advantage of some of this. Because when he plays his b6 move, his knight is never going to have uh -huh. that b6 square now. Which means it's always going to be stuck on the last two ranks. And this turns out to be a big theme for the game. Um, we'll see how it ends. Uh, but that knight being stuck on the back ranks becomes a big theme. Um, queen e2 is what you play. Um, and bishop b7. So he gets his bishop fianchettoed, and then you castle. Castle, yep. And then he plays a5. Um, so tell me what you're thinking now. a5 was a little bit of a mysterious move. Um, I was thinking he would try to play the c5 mm -hmm. move anyway, and uh, you know challenge my center. My plan was, hey, OK. I will um, basically guard this d4 pawn, maybe directly or indirectly. Uh, I'll bring a rook to d1. My rook on d1 will sort of kind of be bothering his queen on d8 a little bit. Uh, the other rook comes to c1. And basically, I have a, I think I have a pretty pleasant mm -hmm. advantage. Um, 
I'm controlling at this point, call it four to five ranks of the board, right? I've got a pawn on d4, a pawn mm -hmm. on e5, so I'm, uh, and he's really only playing on three to four ranks. So I should be a little bit better just by virtue of that. My rooks have a clear path forward. Um, and if you imagine, like, Chris has drawn where the two rooks will move, um, where is black's queen going to go? Uh, when that center opens up, the C and D files open up, where's Black's Queen going to go? And so I think that's where he landed on this A5 move of he wants to bring his knight to A6, but he needs to guard it. But um, it's all very, it's all starting to look a little bit strange. Like when he played A5, it's clear that he recognized, oh, he missed his shot to bring his knight out uh, with that bishop D7 to C6 maneuver and then knight D7 to B6 to mm -hmm. D5 maneuver. And you just, you, you play uh, one of the rooks that you were planning, you know, it, yep. it gets a bunch of extra scope. It's a nice semi-open file. And it was the only piece he hadn't exactly. touched yet, uh, which is a... Yeah, that's true. Um, it's a very simple yeah. chess in a lot of ways. Like, it's common goals of, hey, you know, like, just bring out all your pieces, uh, start making threats, and hopefully some good things will happen. And then uh, your opponent plays rook a7. So first a5 and now rook a7. Um, what 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 is he thinking now? Do you think this was um, at this point, so confused? He had up to uh, he demonstrates his plan in a couple moves where he's gonna try and get his queen to this long diagonal on a8 actually. Um, so he's also worried about what do I do with my queen when the center center opens up uh -huh. and so his plan is to play his knight out and then put his queen on a8 wow uh, that's very creative yeah that's bag. that's a very creative uh, solution it julio is a um i, I think i mentioned that he's a self-taught player uh -huh. in a lot of ways and i i mean to be a 26 30 grandmaster um actually that's a higher rating than i i got to mm -hmm. um but uh, I think sometimes he's a little too creative, probably for his own <laughs> yeah. good. So in this case, he um, he's trying to make some art at the board, and it uh, ends up sort of uh, blowing up. Soon. Yeah, and <laughs> and that rook on uh, a7 is 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 going to be you know kind of awkwardly placed. I mean, oh, 100%. Yeah, the... it it ends up um, that that rook on a7 really has no future, which is part of his. He's trying to solve problems with one piece or another mm -hmm. piece, but uh, his solutions are always and end up sort of misplacing another one. And then you just bring rook f to d1, putting a rook in the same file as your opponent's queen. And then uh, knight a6. Yeah. And um, I, I see in the chat that somebody asked about uh, bringing the knight to c6, which is um, the problem with knight c6 is I I'm going to play something like bishop e3 or bishop c3. Mm -hmm. And then I'll play d e5 and uh right now he needs that bishop on b7 that diagonal to be mm -hmm. open uh so that way he can control that d5 square um as soon as he plays knight c6 the knight has no moves afterwards it can't go to a5 can't go to b4 can't go to e7 the bishop on e7 has no moves actually yep. either right and so um he can develop the knight to c6 but then he doesn't have a follow-up move and that's always one of the things that like i would recommend is like so okay, I go here, my opponent goes there, then what do I do? Um, it's stuck. So yeah. that's where um, it's the same idea with knight d7. If he plays knight d7, his knight still has no more moves. Um, his one shot after knight d7 is to play for mm -hmm. c5, but that's where he's worried about his queen um, being yeah. on the d file. And so uh, knight d7, I think, is probably still probably the best move, really. But um, he. He committed to his plan with a5, rook a7, and he went um, he went all in here by playing knight a6. Okay, and you play bishop e3. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously that, that gets rid of one uh, barrier between your rook and his queen. Uh, yep, so he can't play mm -hmm. c5 now because I'll play d take c5. The d file opens mm -hmm. with tempo. Um, he starts to get his queen off that uh, rank now, or sorry, the uh, D file now by playing queen a8. Here it comes, yeah. And this is where, um, yeah, yeah. I, this is where things get a little bit interesting because you'll notice that 
He's put four of his pieces all on the A and B files, right? So he's got this cluster of pieces uh-huh. on the queen side. So who's guarding yeah. the king side? Um, and that that then gives me sort of my next idea or my plan of like, well, okay, he's fully distracted here. How can I bring um, how can I bring some more force to the king side? And so I play what might look to be a weird move here with knight e one, um, but the whole point of knight e one was that I want to get my queen into mm-hmm. the attack. And this knight's in the way right now. So let me let me move it. Let me go backwards. That's okay. Um, one move backwards, not yeah. the end of the world. Um, and it it was keep, it was pinned ahead, to G two, and yeah, it was pinned to G two. So I couldn't go any yeah. just anywhere. I couldn't go to D two, sure. for example. But the knight on E one guards the pawn on G two. It's, so, yep. it's a really pretty move, and it opens up the the diagonal for for your queen to. Uh, Get out there and uh, cause some problems. Let's see, Rook D8. And one other thing mm-hmm. I would just note about um, whether it's after Rook D8 or even before Rook D8, as soon as Black plays this move, Bishop D5, uh, to challenge White's mm-hmm. Bishop, White can actually take the Knight on A6, the Rook takes the Bishop back, and then my Rook on C1 takes his pawn on C7. Whoa. So yeah. it's, it's a little bit of a... yeah. Like, he's sort of getting into trouble here where he can always solve one problem, but he's always, like, he he never can solve all his problems uh, yeah. all at once here. And so that's um, one of the big challenges for him. He wants to oppose mm-hmm. my bishop, but how does he do it safely? And so he plays rook d8. I play queen g4. And so I'm, I'm just executing mm-hmm. my plan. Um, I want to bring more pieces to the king side. Uh, one possible threat here, or one idea for me, is going to be play this move like bishop h6. Um, I have ideas of bishop h6. Maybe the rook comes up to c3 and g3. Uh, I've got a bunch of attacking ideas here for sure. Um, but he uh, he he accelerates the end, so he knows that bishop d5 now. I take on a6. Rook takes uh, bishop on a6, and my my rook takes the pawn mm-hmm. on c7. Um, and so he tries to get his knight out of the way here by yeah. retreating his knight, but that only, yeah, it's like the theme of the game. He solves one problem and yep. introduces another. Yeah, and 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 again, I mean, look, look at these uh, uh, four pieces. <laughs> Just in, uh, in... <laughs> he he's a twenty six thirty grandmaster. He was top hundred yeah. in the world, um, but yeah, he uh, in this game he's. He's sort of yeah, totally when you bamboozled. Get too creative. Sometimes this happens, um, and uh, yep. I, I admire his creativity, you know. Um, and, but you know, um, another thing that's important is making sure that you know your your plan is flexible, and uh, his his arrangement over here with the queen and bishop is not very flexible. It's you know if if it works, it's it's going to work spectacularly. Um, but, uh, you're, you know, white's pieces are just so much better placed. Let's see what happens. Uh, oh. Yeah, and so when you, you get uh-huh. to a position like this, I, like I see in the comments, weirdest uh-huh. configuration ever. Uh, as soon as you start seeing, um, your opponents doing something like that, uh, you should start looking for some tactical opportunities. How do I take advantage of my opponent's, like, weirdest configuration um, things like that. And here I've been getting ready to mm-hmm. attack on the king side, right? I brought my, um, and this is where sort of I land sort of the, the final blow. Uh, I take a pawn on e6. I just sacrifice the bishop. Mm-hmm. You get two pawns and a check. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I start. I start with two pawns and a check. It, um, it's only going to, the price is only going to go up yeah. from there. <laughs> and then, um, the king's got to move. Um, he has to move to f8. If he moves to h8, then he just drops the sure. bishop for free. And so um, he moves to f8, and he's officially got, uh, you know, a piece for two pawns. But remember that knight on a6 retreated, mm-hmm. right? The knight was the only thing guarding the pawn on c7. Mm-hmm. So now I can take the pawn on c7. And there's a new yeah. threat. Queen takes e7 yeah. check. Uh, and mate follows from there. Um, and he threw in the towel mm-hmm. at this point. If he plays a move like rook e8, for example, or knight c6, uh, he can guard the bishop on e7, but pretend he plays either move. Um, I will then play bishop g5, actually, and I'll Ooh. overload this bishop on e7. Yeah. 
uh, where he can't move it away. Pretend that Bishop on G uh, E7 ever moves. I'll play Queen F7 yeah. checkmate. Um, and so, basically, he's he's all tied up. Um, his queen on A8, his rook on A7. It's almost as though they don't even exist yeah. here. Yeah, that that's a, a really interesting game. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you you brought up the point of when when you see your opponent not following, and you talked about the you know the thirty rules of chess and this and that, and and um, your opponent was you know um, a very strong opponent, but he's not following the basic principles of chess. And you need to look for punishing moves, and uh, you 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 found them. Um, let's move to that second game you sent me. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one other note uh -huh. I would say on this game with Julio. One of the reasons why, like uh, for me, it was um, one of the games I highlighted in the book is that uh, it led to my second Grandmaster Norm. Um, that was played early on in the tournament. I think this was like around three or four game. Uh, ended up playing a number of other like good games at tournament, uh, but for me that was like, oh yeah, like I um, I can't play good chess mm -hmm. again. Uh, I hadn't played a lot of tournaments for a bit, uh, and so it was it was nice just to be able to do that. Yeah, yep. uh, uh, you know, a, a twenty move win versus a a strong grandmaster. That's yep. a, that that'll get your confidence up, um, and then uh, ooh. Uh, looks like uh, we're going to see you play uh, Marcel Martinez. What can you tell us? This is a uh, this is a, a name that I'm quite familiar with, but I think um, a lot of people in chat probably don't know a lot about Marcel. Yeah, I mean Marcel, um, he uh, Cuban immigrant. Uh, he was extremely talented chess player. So I played him a number of times growing up. Um, actually, he won. The U.S. Junior Championship ahead of me in 1999. Actually, he took first. I took second. Uh, super friendly guy, actually, as well. Um, and uh, like me, he actually stopped playing chess regularly. Um, pro probably by the early 2010s. Um, he's a few years older than me, but basically around the same age. I think he stopped playing chess regularly. Um, and this game was played in something called the U.S. Chess League. Uh, Marcel plays for the Miami team, and I used to play for the San Francisco mm -hmm. team. Um, and uh, we've we've done battle a number of times. This is actually a book that's not. Uh, sorry, this is a game that's not actually in the book. Um, I uh, I was tempted to include it because I I, I enjoyed the game quite a bit. Uh, but um, you know, there's only so much space for me to share my games in the book, and so. Uh, Take it as a sign that there are more interesting games in the book than even this. Okay, one. awesome. Yeah, I mean, when, when, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there were uh, th this game was one of many that didn't quite make the final cut. It's like maybe, um, maybe being a, a, a director of a movie, right? You, yeah. A little bit, yeah. I think I tried to pick games that, um, for me, some of them had like. They're either against like the most famous opponents, like a Magnus Carlsen or a Fabiana mm -hmm. Caruana, uh, David Bronstein, or there were games that were like uh, where there's like some life moment, chess life moment that was associated mm -hmm. with it as well. Um, by the time I played this game in 2013, I wasn't playing as much tournament chess anymore, just anyway. Um, and so uh, I did include a game against Marcel because he was like one of my frequent sort of uh, opponents. Um, and we, we, like, he beat me, I beat him, uh, but um, I included one of our other games from a few years prior because uh, it felt like the story, the story in that game was, I thought, uh, like a better story in some way, even if the chess here was probably a little bit Okay, let's, let's take a look, see what happens. So Marcel is white. Um, let, me, let me do a, a flipper -roo then, so we're looking at it from your perspective. Um, why isn't the board flipping? It should be. Oh, there it goes. All right. It just took a took a moment. I have a lot of resources running on uh, on uh, my computer right now. All right. So Marcel no plays e4, and you play e6, French defense. Yep. And this was my main opening for a long time. I used to play e4, e6, sometimes e4, e5, mm -hmm. the double king pawns. Uh, and Marcel had, um, actually most of our games, uh, I chose the French defense against him because 
he used to play e4 e5 himself as a uh from from the black side and so he, i always thought he knew those openings a little bit better than me because he played mm -hmm. it from both colors uh whereas the french defense he was basically always uh playing only from the white side so um that's typically why against marcel almost always interesting French. interesting uh d4 and then d5 knight c3 and then uh, bishop b4, pinning pinning the uh, knight. And this is the winnower, right? Yep, this is the winnower French. There's a lot of moves here for white. Um, the main move mm -hmm. is e5. Uh, so the, the point of pinning the knight is black starting just to take the pawn on e4. So white generally has to do something about that pawn on e4 because with the knight pin, you mm -hmm. can't recapture. Uh, so e5 is the most common move, but there's actually a ton of other moves. Um, uh, white can play knight e2 even, which I um, I have some games in the book mm -hmm. from the white side from knight e2. Um, I have uh, there, e takes d5 is another move, um, entering a kind of exchange mm -hmm. French kind of structure. Uh, Marcel played something a little bit different, more much more offbeat. He played bishop d3 here, which guards the pawn with the bishop. Um, for those of you who know David Proust in the Bay Area, uh, international master David Proust had played this against me as well um, a few years earlier. And uh, that was the first time I think I had ever faced it in a tournament game. Um, the idea is, yeah, you guard, the, you guard the pawn. I trade on e4, though. And um, after d takes e4, bishop takes e4. Knight f6. White's idea is he wants to put the bishop on the long diagonal, mm -hmm. keep it on that a diagonal. So he plays bishop f3. Um, and his point here is, uh, remember, like just the game we looked at against Julio, Black had trouble developing his queen side, and Julio tried to fianchetto that bishop. Here, Black's bishop on c8 is still stuck, but you can never play bishop d7 now because bishop mm -hmm. takes b7, right? Um, if you play knight c6, you don't get to challenge the pawn on d4 very well. Um, and so uh, this is White's whole idea here. There are some reasons why I think this isn't so popular. When I played it against Proust, I played c5 here as black. But um, I had looked at that game since then. And uh, for this game, I decided uh -huh. castle. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, but certainly you wouldn't have uh, chosen the French defense if you weren't... Uh... Um, you know, uh, if the thought of having a, a a big question looming for your bishop on c8 uh, bugged you, the French defense, is, yeah. No, that's that's definitely true. I think it's um, again, it speaks to my preference sometimes for mm -hmm. knights over bishops, where um, the French defense leads to a lot of block pawn structures, a lot of maneuvering with the knights, and that was always something I was uh, mm -hmm. very happy to do. So castle. Um, and knight to e2, so he's getting ready to castle mm -hmm. as well. And then you play e5. Um, yeah. And this was, um, this was my big idea. This is why I didn't play the way I played against David Proust. I won that game against Proust, so, uh, it wasn't as though something bad had mm -hmm. happened in that game. But I assumed that maybe Marcel had seen that game. Maybe he'd found some improvement for White. Uh, but I had looked at my own game against David Proust, and so that's why like, I had this idea mm -hmm. for this game um, of sacrificing the e-pawn. Now, like, remember I said that Black has problems developing that bishop mm -hmm. on c8, and White's done some stuff a little bit differently here, right? So White has the first move advantage, but actually I got to castle first as Black. White's king is still in the center, um, and so there's a chance here to try and take advantage of having actually maybe a slightly better development in some way than you would normally mm -hmm. expect. Uh, and the whole idea here is that after white takes his pawn on um, mm -hmm. e5, I trade queens on d1, queen mm -hmm. d1 check, and he has to give up his right to castle. He has to take it back with the king because the knight's pinned. And so now I'm basically banking on the fact that his king is in the center is going to be worth this pawn that I've sacrificed. And um, that's the whole sort of idea of this gambit. Uh, and one of the reasons I was kind of happy with this game is that, like, um, I, gen I, I generally was viewed as like kind of like a classical player 
uh, but somewhat mm -hmm. aggressive. Um, and so uh, I would like to attack, especially after the opening. But attacking in the end game is something that I think a lot of people sometimes don't expect. And here the queens are off the board, but I'm actually still looking to attack. So uh, you pl you do attack. You play knight g4, threatening a, a nice fork mm -hmm. right off the bat. And uh, um, he takes the knight, and you take back, and now you're pinning the, the knight on uh, e2 to his exposed king. Um, and he doesn't like that, so he plays f3. And you need to move your bishop someplace safe. I mean, you could throw in a check first, I, I suppose, but... Could, could throw in a check. Um, I'm actually hoping to bring that mm -hmm. other rook out and give that check. Um, ideally, I want my rooks almost on e8 or d8, uh -huh. e8 and d8, so control sure. both center files. That's why I, I, I hold off on the check for now. The point of bishop f5 is that um, his king's in the center, right? And so at some point when I give that check, his king's going to have to go somewhere. If he goes to e1, my bishop will be hitting that c2 pawn, so I'll just get my pawn back for uh -huh. free. Um, if he goes to c1, though, how is he ever going to bring that rook on a1 yeah. into the game? And so uh, that's sort of my thinking here of I'm playing for some long-term compensation. Uh, I'm not actually getting the pawn back anytime soon. Like, um, that's okay, but I've got two bishops, his king's in the center, um, and my development's pretty good, so um, I'm happy with my position right now. And he, uh, he plays g4, grabbing some space, attacking your bishop. And yep. you go bishop e6. I can't stay on that diagonal for too long because uh, my if I play bishop g6, I'm running mm -hmm. out of squares there. Um, so potentially there's f4, mm -hmm. f5 ideas, or there's h4, h5 yeah. ideas. And so I come back to e6 because um, g4 is actually kind of a weakening move. Now the f3 pawn's a little bit weak. And so uh, remember how I said before that I want my rooks on mm -hmm. e8 and d8? Now I might actually want this rook on the f file because that f3 uh -huh. pawn is going to be a problem. If f3 pawn falls, then the uh -huh. g4 pawn's weak. So everybody's um, there's all everything's sort of connected at this point. He plays a3, um, mm -hmm. bugging your other bishop, and you go ahead and uh, take on c3, getting rid of your uh, and, getting rid of your bishop pair. Exactly. I, I, the The name of the game for me in this one is all about kind of development and, uh, you know, kind of bringing my pieces uh -huh. out with tempo. Um, and so even though I'm giving up the bishop pair here, I've got some weaknesses now on f3, g4, mm -hmm. e5 that I want to take advantage of. And so um, this is probably a little bit concrete. Normally I'd want to keep just mm -hmm. the bishop pair, but here it's I've seen a specific variation. So I can develop with knight c6 now and uh, attack yeah. that e5. And your rooks are already unified. Um, he's he's nowhere near. His his pieces are, are um, very disorganized. He has he has one good piece, the, the knight on uh, c3. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah. King e2. So he's getting his king out of the way of his uh, his rooks. Um, and his point here is that if I play knight takes e5, he's uh -huh. going to play bishop f4. Uh, my knight's kind of pinned, and so from his perspective, he's actually probably playing to equalize at this point. So um, knight takes e5, bishop f4, and all of a sudden our development's yep. actually kind of simple. Yep. Uh, and I, even though I, like, I'm down a pawn here, I'm looking for a little bit more. So I actually play knight d4 to yep. back. And then king f2. King f2, and here I don't even bother taking the pawn on c2 either. He... He keeps wanting to give me a uh -huh. pawn to try and uh, equalize the position, get all his pieces out, and I keep saying, like, no, 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 like, I'm, I'm going for a little bit this, more here. You know, uh, uh, not taking that pawn on c2, that had to have been very tempting, because you get the pawn and a threat on the rook. Um, yeah, so you, um, yeah. 100%. It's, uh, in this case, probably in a blitz game, I might have actually just played knight uh -huh. takes c2. Um, but in a slow game with a little bit more time, this is where I, I take advantage of the fact my rook is still on f8, and I can open that f file to start yeah. attacking his king. So I play very, f6. Very, very nice move. Um, and uh, he, he does not want his king in that file when it opens. Um, 
because, you know, as you've already talked about, F3 is weak. You're going to add the, the rook. Um, the bishop can come <laughs> and, and attack it as well. So he, he gets out. Yeah, no, he, exactly. He gets out of there. Yep. And uh, you then uh, use the F pawn to take his center pawn. Um, yeah. Which, yeah. So now I've, I've equalized the material again. And uh, equalized material, I'm still ahead in development. Um, and he still has some of these weak pawns, right? C2 mm -hmm. is still hanging. F3 is still hanging. Mm -hmm. So um, he's in some trouble here. And so his whole plan of giving the pawn back to equalize, um, it actually it hasn't gone according to plan. <laughs> he plays F4. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you, you know, again, you, you have multiple, uh, multiple choices here. But you uh, go ahead and take on C2 now, grab that pawn, and threaten the rook. Um, was that an easy decision for you? This time it was a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I've already gotten um, everything I kind of want in this. And if you, and so I'm if actually you take on F4, on maybe you're helping him a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I'll develop uh -huh. his bishop for him, and then he can bring his rook out from yeah. the corner. Um, so the main reason to take first is if I ever want to take on F4, I don't want his rook to come to mm -hmm. the center. And by taking on C2 first, I force it... Okay, he has to play rook mm -hmm. b1, which isn't as active. Yeah. Um, and then... And here, though, I saw another option for me after rook b1, which is that I don't even have to... T he's attacking my pawn uh -huh. on e5, but I don't actually have to deal with that threat. That's one of the nice things about chess, is that just because you see you can take a piece doesn't mean you actually have to take anything. And here, I want to bring more force into the attack. So my big idea here is this rook coming to d3 mm -hmm. with check. And um, again, that was the only piece you hadn't touched yet. Um, you've touched mm -hmm. all your pieces, and uh, your opponent has still not moved his uh, rook on h1 or bishop on c1. And his rook yep. on b1, um, yep. yeah, it's moved to uh, a not so great spot. It's, uh, and, yeah, it, it technically uh -huh. counts, but it doesn't. Uh, I think that's one of the things um, you're highlighting about the sort of playing with all your pieces that for me was. Um, when I was uh, playing well, typically, I had good harmony amongst all my pieces and I was mm -hmm. using all of them. But it's usually when I would, um, when I was like maybe playing poorly, I noticed that, wait, I'm not using all my pieces well. I'm like not asking myself, hey, like, uh, don't some of these other guys want to join the party? But um, here is, it was all very simple. He plays F5. Um, mm -hmm taking the, the tension off of uh, e5, but attacking your bishop on e6. And, uh, um, you know, the people in, in, in camp um, know, you know, um, before we uh, react, before we overreact to danger, we should analyze the checks, captures, and threats. And, uh, yeah, the bishop's under attack, but Vinay has a nice check. Rook... I used to actually um, write that uh -huh. as a note to myself, uh, check for, um, basically look for checks, mm -hmm. captures, yep. things like that. That was one of the things in my notebook that I used to write to myself of like, no, I got to get in yep. the habit of doing that. It's, it's so important because, uh, you know, when you do it in that order, you're looking at the most forcing variations and the, the branches are easier to calculate and all combinations are, are based on double attacks and so um, you're you're really upping the chance that you'll spot um, the the winning tactic but you're you're um, subtracting from the number of games you'll lose because of a real bonehead blunder so che checks true, captures true. threats yeah. um, but, and king f2 and what was interesting about this is, like, on the previous move, I could uh -huh. have moved the bishop, right? But now with his king on f2, the pawn is pinned, so he's yeah. not actually threatening anything. Um, so I don't have to react to that threat now because I made mm -hmm. my, my check first. Um, and because of that, I actually ended up playing a uh, move I was pretty happy with interesting. here, uh, e4. Uh, um, uh, t tell me about what you're, what you're doing with e4. 
With E4, there's really mm -hmm. uh, a couple ideas. One is that I'm, I'm setting up some, uh, some threats of Rook F3 check, for example. Um, so I'm further sort of, uh, I'm getting mm -hmm. a little bit deeper into his position that way. The other thing is that if he plays knight takes e4, my point is that I'll play bishop d5 then. And the knight is pinned to the rook on h1. And the rook can't come to e1 because my knight on c2 yeah. covers the e1 square, right? So how does he ever, how does he save his knight and his rook? He's got to give yeah. up something. Um, and so that's the main idea is that because he went back to f2, I don't actually have to move the bishop right away. And now I can make a, another threat by... Um, yeah, and he can't touch that very, one. Very, very nice. Um, yeah, that that's one of those those moves that a lot of us would miss. But that's why uh, that's you know this is why uh, you're you're a grandmaster. And uh, bishop, bishop g five. So finally, he has you know got gotten his bishop out, and his rooks are are coordinated in the in the back rank. Um, yep. But his his rooks are you know they they see each other, but they're still they have no forward scope. Um, yep. Yeah, that's right. And uh, um, his bishop on g5 is not defended, so he he brought it out. Exactly, so that and that's the key point. It's developed, uh, but it's it's you know you, you look for you, you you put that in your um, in your uh, uh, list of targets. No, I, I, I you you highlighted the key point and um, what you mentioned before of uh, checks captures mm -hmm. threats. Um, this is a a chance where I could look at the checks first with like rook f3 mm -hmm. check. Uh, but then if I go through that list and I look at captures, what can I take in this position? Well, one of the things I can take is the pawn on f5. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I play bishop takes f5, g takes uh, f5, you know, pawn takes the mm -hmm. bishop back, rook takes the pawn with check. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, then I'm hitting that bishop on yeah. g5 that you mentioned unprotected. Yeah. And so that's where um, I. In this, uh, in this one, it was kind of just basically following your formula, mm -hmm. right? So it's like always be looking for uh, checks, captures, threats, uh, and that's actually like that kind of train of thinking led me to all these moves. Like, hey, rook d8. I don't have to deal with the, his thing mm -hmm. first. I can give a check, which is a m more forcing move. And then he steps out of check with king e2. And you could you could take the bishop. I could take the bishop, but I decided to give one more uh, thing in between yeah. before. So, uh, like you said, checks are always the most forcing. Um, I gave a little knight check here because it's a little bit... Uh, it's just a nice little touch, I feel mm -hmm. like. Um, the king only has one move, so he has to go back to e1 at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and then I, I can take the bishop on g5. Mm -hmm. uh, if he plays knight takes e4, then I play rook e3 check, and I win the knight for free, too, yeah. right? So he doesn't, by, by giving this knight on d4 check, I open up the e3 square for myself. Yeah. Uh, and it's a nice little touch, which just, I think, it drives home how helpless he is in this position as well. Yeah. Very, very nice game. And uh, th thank you for, you know, choosing uh, uh, unique games. You're, you're a, f uh, a famous guy again. You're, you're, you're a huge star. Um, you were interviewed on uh, uh, Chess Base India, right? I mean, these are these are uh, you know, and and you're you're here with us, um, and everybody in the camp is working hard. They're really inspired. I talked about it um, in our in our uh, morning meeting, um, and uh, everybody's been working really hard to try and get an autographed copy of this book, which. I, awesome. Like I said, you know, I, I have it in my mind as one of my uh, top five uh, uh, favorite chess books ever, and it, it's brand new. It's brand new. Um, it's it's so exciting, and it's great to uh, great to have you uh, back and visible in the chess community again, Vinay. It, it's it's just absolutely absolutely wonderful, and what a way to come back, you know, with with your life's journey, and. Uh, um, it's not just a, a, a book that's a, uh, and, and it's so wonderful because it's an ins inspiring story, um, but there's so much instruction in there too, and, and analysis. Just like uh, Vinay explained these two games to us here, he, ex he explains dozens of games in here. Um, 
And so uh, you'll get much stronger. It's, it's a fun read and you'll get much stronger. Um, and uh, Vinay, um, some people may not win the book. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so my question to you is uh, if, if they don't win an, an autographed copy of the book, um, how can they get themselves a copy? There, um, it's a good question. There are a few different mm -hmm. options. Uh, if you want a physical copy, um, you can always reach out to me. Um, uh, I think Chris has mm -hmm. my email uh, address. You can find me on Facebook. Um, and I'm happy to send a, or share an autographed copy. Um, if you prefer to learn online, there is actually an electronic book as well. It's through the app called Forward mm -hmm. Chess. Um, and uh, forward chess is neat because uh, for their chess books, you can actually play through all the moves. So um, it's a little bit like you get a playable board and you can follow mm -hmm. along. Um, but if you want a physical book and um, you're interested in getting one, feel free to reach out. Uh, I, I can, um, I'm sure Chris can share sure, my email absolutely. address. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, put it, um, up. Yeah, we'll put it up on the blog and, um, and uh, awesome. uh, you know, with, with a scan of the... Uh, cover of the book and uh, make sure everybody who's part of the daily chess museums community knows how to get it and i'm gonna be honest here i recommend both get yourself both get yourself the uh, digital copy and the hard copy this is a this is a, a very special book um and for a lot of the younger players for for people of my generation yeah i'm used to you know looking through a chess book and reading the moves and, and visualizing um, uh, the generation of, uh, chess players that are in our camp, by and large, they're used to, uh, watching, you know, um, a chessboard on a, uh, on a device. Um, but with a, uh, with a book like, as good as this, you want a copy on your, in, in your personal chess library. Um, but for ease of use, um, get yourself the, uh, digital copy as well. And uh, it's going to take me a little while to add up all the points you guys are collecting from camp. But by um, this time next week, I should have the announcement of who our three winners are from this week. Uh, Vinay, is there anything else you would like to, um, you know, promote, uh, um, you know, uh, or, or mention um, before, before you go? Uh, no, I, I think the main thing is thanks for having me, Chris. Um, thanks also for the kind words. I think for me, um, one of the things that like, I, I haven't been in the chess world for a while like I follow, uh, but I haven't written anything, I haven't played anything, but um, it's been really awesome to hear some of the, like I wasn't sure how people would receive sort of my story, um, but it's been really awesome to hear from you and others just um, how I, I think uh, how interesting and maybe inspiring that story has been. Um, for me, actually, after the Chess Base India interview, um, Grandmaster Vishwanath Anand, uh, he reached out to me. Uh, he heard about it, um, and I had met him before, but um, he he listened to a bit of the interview and said, nice job. Wow. And for me, that was like, uh, you know, basically the equivalent of Michael Jordan saying, hey, like, wow. not a bad yeah, I, I mean, player. and so, uh, of course, as a... Uh, um you know, Indian American, uh, first generation, um, or, or just a, a person in the chess community is, as well. And, uh, but I'm sure, uh, was, uh, was Anand your, uh, your favorite chess player? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think, um, as a little kid, I mm -hmm. liked Capablanca a lot and then, um, call it by about 94, 95. I learned a little bit more about Anand, and um, he easily became like my favorite uh, chess player. Um, I used to follow, I, I, I tried to make an effort basically to mm -hmm. follow all his games. Uh, and uh, yeah, so for, for him basically to, to reach out was like, oh man, okay. I, I was on, uh, I, he basically made my work. Absolutely, with that comment. Abs that, that's amazing. Um, what a, uh, you know, to, to have your hero reach out to you and and say nice job that that's 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 amazing um and uh um yeah i i, I second it nice job Vinay. it's it's a wonderful book 
and uh, thank you. And we'll have you again um, in the uh, in the July camp, um, and uh, with yep. with a couple more games. This was a, a fun hour. Um, th thank you very much, Vinay. Have it have a great day, and uh, we'll uh, talk soon. Awesome. Yeah. Th thanks, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the camp. And thanks, Bye. Chris, again for having me.